and it's Amplified Maryland Voice of People with Disabilities through Centers for Independent Living. I am is pleased to bring you this program of interest to and importance to people with disabilities um, throughout the nation. These programs are recorded and will be on YouTube in a couple of days uh, usually. So if there's things here that you want to go recapture, you can. Uh, you will be muted. In fact, Heather, even as we speak, is muting you, even though you couldn't feel it. It happened to you. Uh, use the chat box if you like with questions, or you can raise your hand if you have a question, or uh, there will be time at the end for questions. So well, there's all kinds of ways to ask questions, and the more you participate, the more we learn about what you need. There will be community announcements at the end, so those of you who are with other organizations other than Centers for Independent Living or including Centers for Independent Living who have community announcements about things that are going on, please feel free to um, make those announcements at the end as we present that part as a community service so that you can let the world know what your organization is doing. Um, next week on uh, let me remind you that a couple of things next week on the IM broadcast we're going to talk about veteran directed services and so be prepared for that but for this week I have the pleasure of introducing someone who is always there when we need her someone who is capable confident competent and uh, and just a delightful person to work with Katie Erke with um, uh, in, with, with uh, accessible resources for independence, this Center for Independent Living that serves Anne Arundel and Howard County. Katie, welcome to the program, and thank you so much for handling this, this um, program this week. I turn it over to you. Wow. I'm like blushing over here. I don't think I've <laughs> ever been described as any of those things in the world ever. Oh, you deserve um, it all. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Um, it's all a pleasure working with you as well. Um, so today we have Jay Clayton with the Maryland Transit Administration. Um, and Jamie might be joining us, right? Jamie McKay, maybe, maybe not. She had a conflict. Um, but Jade is here to talk about um, a, a project that the Maryland Transit Administration has been charged with. Um, and it's a statewide plan for transportation. It's for me. All right. Anybody have community announcements, things that are going on in your world that you want to tell people about? Please let us know. Yeah, I do. All right. Who's that? Okay. Well, uh, uh, I'm thinking about getting Maryland Adapt up and going again, but I'm right. going to need, I'm not positive on that. So I'll probably make a, an official announcement in a week or two and I could talk about it to you all on, uh, okay. on this one, on this Broadcast. Crosby King, thank you. ADAPT is a very important part of the advocacy that goes on in Maryland, so I'm glad to hear that you're trying to think of ways to maybe revive that. Because if you guys aren't causing really big, good trouble, then who is, right? Yeah, and there's a, it's a good time to start. Well, there's the just trouble. a lot of good trouble to get into right now. Yeah, sure is. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was going to talk a little bit to, to everyone today and say, please, if you haven't voted yet and uh, uh, go vote, it is it is important. Um, your vote really does count. I can assure you there will be hundreds of elections throughout the United States today or tomorrow that will be settled by less than 100 votes. There will be several that are settled by less than 50 votes. Um, people's votes really do count. And the 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 thing that democracies depend on is that you and I participate. So please, if you haven't voted or if you're thinking, oh, I doubt that I'll be able to find time, uh, go vote. I know it doesn't seem like Maryland is in the thick of the big decision about who's going to be the president, but it is. Um, I would remind many people that in uh, that, that several years ago, uh, Maryland voters didn't turn out, and and we have a Republican governor. Uh, I think uh, I think that has all worked out well. But what what was dis disturbing or disheartening about it was that in a lot of ways it was because people just didn't bother to vote. So please know that your vote makes a difference. I know democracies are frustrating. I know people don't do what you want them to do all the time. I get all that. I'm as frustrated as you are. If everybody would just do what I told them to, they'd be fine. But they don't. So please, um, please vote. 
please take that action at least and be a part. And if you are, have connection to a phone bank and you're still trying to encourage people, get out there and get phone banking this evening, this afternoon and this evening. To We have lists of people who haven't voted that you need to call, so please get out there and call them. Jade, are you back yet? So uh -oh. Jade is on the phone. She is. Uh, so we That's might cool. need to unmute her. Jade yeah, we need Baltimore. To know a phone number. It says Jade Baltimore. Oh, can you unmute her, Heather? I'm working on it. All okay. Right. <laughs> All right. Um, I cannot. She's muted herself. Oh. It's star. Oh, you gotta do six. star six. Jade. There we go. All right. You there, Jade? All right, Jade, are you there? Hello. Hello, Chiffon's here. How are you? Hi, Chiffon. We're just waiting for Jade because she's she's the show host, but she can't uh, access us for some reason. Star six, Jade. She okay, looks like she's figuring it out on her phone from right. what the video shows. Um, yeah. This is Audrey. So on the subject uh, from ARI, this is the subject of uh, voting. So I went to... Um, m and uh, Stadium, I think, you know, yeah. yards, uh, to vote the other day. And, you know, I've never uh, had to wait in the line before, so I was a little bit worried about that. Um, I have a mobility impairment. And when I got there, uh, as soon as I walked up, I mean, I do have a visible disability, so there's that. They said, uh, would you like somewhere to sit inside? You know, do you have trouble standing? And so I was able to just sit there and listen to my tunes. Do you have any of those um, so bars open? Don't worry about that. Hmm? Do you have any of the bars open on the second floor? You could have gone up there and waited. <laughs> no, the, the, I was oh. in the bar. It oh. was it was held in the bar on the first floor, but it didn't oh. look like they were serving. Oh, okay, fine. Just yeah. checking. All right. So um, also remember, you know, even if Maryland's blue, um, you know, and you are as well, uh, you know, this election, it matters a lot. Like change starts from the bottom. So, you know, make sure you vote local. Uh, too. And remember that, you know, you don't have to vote for everything on the ballot. If you don't understand something, that's okay, too. Your ballot won't be invalid. Yeah, in Baltimore, we're electing a mayor and we've got about $150 million worth of bonds to review and decide whether we want to approve or not approve. There's a lot going on at the local level as well. So, yeah. And if you need <laughs> help investigating your ballot, um, the League of Women Voters is completely nonpartisan and has a great voter guide, which is newly screen reader accessible, according to what I've seen. So it's vote411.org. I'll put it in the chat. Okay. All right. So Jade, are you, uh, are you there? Can you hear me? moving. Yes. Okay. Uh, I can't, I saw the chat that I could email you the slides, but I have the slides open from a remote server, so I cannot email them to you. Oh, okay. No worries. But, um, I can speak to them, I think, um, until my computer unfreezes. Oh, sorry for these Go right technical ahead. difficulties. <laughs> I think it's because we are technically not supposed to use Zoom on our work computers. Hmm. Um, and so I can't download it and I'm using it through the browser and that just eats up my entire Well, that's fine. Or you can computer. just skip the slides and just talk to us. We'll be good with that, too. Okay. Um, <laughs> So doing this off of memory, <laughs> the, um, so we came here to talk about the Maryland Statewide Transit Plan, which we started developing back in June of this year. And it's going to be a little over a year long process. June was really more of the internal scoping and deciding, you know, how we wanted to outline the plan generally and then plan the outreach around that. So um, the overall approach is that this is a 50 year plan. Um, it's meant to be both visionary, but also have some achievable, quantifiable strategies included maybe for the first 25 years and then a little bit more ambitious and broad for the next 25 years after that to round out the 50 years. Um, and not to repeat or redo a lot of the local and regional planning that's already been done, um, at the local level in Maryland, but to stitch those plans together and create something that's more cohesive and shows the bigger picture for what transit could look like statewide. 
So to, I think, give some perspective on how much can change in 50 years, we usually show a slide that um, shows various transit milestones all the way back to the 1970s when MTA first took over the Baltimore Transit Company. Um, Amtrak was established. We first started subsidizing commuter rail and um, also took over Lutheran services for paratransit. And then in the preceding years, subway and metro rail were expanded in DC and in Baltimore. Um, light rail was established in the 90s and expanded again a few years later. And then more recently, milestones like the construction of Purple Line beginning and the overhaul of the fixed route network in Baltimore um, under the name Baltimore Link. So a lot can change in 50 years and, and that's to just get people in the mindset of how much can change and how big to think for a 50 year plan. Um, and then for the next slide, I believe we showed um, two maps next to each other, one from the early 1970s and one from 2010 and that compares land development and land cover um, in Maryland over that roughly 50 year period. So in 19, in the 1970s, it was about 10% of um, the land that was developed. And most of that was very concentrated around DC, around Baltimore, and then a few um, rural towns and small urban areas spread throughout the state. And then in 2010, you can see that that grew, and I believe it was 27% of the state's land area is covered by development of some kind. And that's really spread out from those initial smaller, more concentrated urban areas and into the suburbs. Cover is sort of just quick history of transit and of land use over the last 50 years and those we're emphasizing those two things is very um, tied together. So we came back out um, in, I wanna say September, we launched a public survey and we had five round tables. So we split all of the counties in Maryland into five regions and we met with those groups and kind of talked about regional needs and presented this draft vision and goals and the public survey was also designed around the vision and goal areas that we came up with initially um, with MTA and MDOT and some other stakeholders. So the vision statement is, Maryland's public transit system will connect people, places, and opportunities supporting Maryland's economy with efficient, equitable, sustainable, and innovative transit. Transit riders across the state will experience convenient and coordinated travel and a dignified customer experience. And then the seven goal areas that we came up with was um, ensure a safe, secure, and resilient transit system, provide inclusive, equitable, and accessible transit choices, deliver a reliable and quality customer experience, facilitate economic opportunity locally and regionally, leverage innovative transit infrastructure and technology, expand and integrate transit options and partnerships, and lastly, ensure environmental and fiscal sustainability. And that is in no particular order because of the surveys and the outreach that we've done, we've kind of pulled people on, you know, what's most important to you and we'll sort of shuffle around and reword based on the input we've received so far. So next we kind of show transit propensity um, and that's based on an analysis of several different factors. It includes um, race, income, um, population density, various attractions in, um, at the census tract level. And again, very similar to the map of developed land, there, it shows that there's higher transit propensity in those denser areas, of which there are in Montgomery and Prince George's County and Baltimore City more um, predominantly. In the map, we label high propensity as red, and so there's a lot of red in those areas. There's also a little bit of high propensity out in Washington County, in Allegheny County, Frederick County, 
um, other areas that are um, relatively dense, even out in rural and suburban areas across the state. So we haven't gone through, the survey closed October 25th, and so we haven't fully analyzed all of the results, but we pulled out one question just to share with um, groups that we're meeting with already um, that asked which uh, parts of your transit trip are currently working well and which need the most improvement. And so they were able to pick whether it works great for them or needs major improvement across several options. Um, so some of the options where more people said it needs improvement than said it works great included customer service and transit staff interactions, um, transferring between different routes or services. I'd say that was one that had the biggest um, response rate of needing improvement, um, unsurprisingly. So transferring between services, kind of a big point <laughs> for um, a statewide transit plan that's talking about many different providers across the state. Um, waiting at the transit stop or station for a bus to arrive was a big one. Um, and then the rest, it seemed like people more often were saying that it worked well for them and those other options were um, riding on the transit vehicle, um, finding and getting to and from the transit stopper station, understanding and purchasing fares, and finding information about their trip before getting on board. Is there any um, initial reaction to those survey results? Is that seem to match up with your experience with transit? Um, are there particular parts along the trip that um, work well or don't work well for each of you? I guess I have a kind of a broader question as I'm listening to you talk. I can't help but think about 50 years is a long time, right? Yes. 2075 I'm sure I won't be alive by then unless we've developed some staying alive technologies that I'm not familiar with yet but um, but but what is how what is the plan doing in order to try to take into account for major technological changes such as self-driving cars uh, such as maybe the ability to have to to, to have computers that could control maybe maybe I have to ride to work with three other people in a vehicle but you know it's not a bus anymore right in other words it's it picks me up and it picks up a couple other people and drops us off uh, a block away from where we all work or whatever I'm just trying to think through how does the plan account for the potential for those kinds of changes Sure. So based on the feedback we've received so far along those lines and you'll see a little bit of it later we heard in the round table sort of mixed reviews on what people think the role of connected and automated vehicles will be as far as transit goes, whether or not um, it will just increase the use of single occupant vehicles, or if it will be geared toward what you're talking about, which is being more shared um, and more efficient in terms of picking up multiple people along the way if people are willing to share that ride. Um, I think that's definitely something that we want to address. Technology advancements will be a big part of it and, and also, you know, how those are used to leverage transit and not just to encourage more um, single occupant use, um, except for where it's truly needed. The other thing I guess, the other thing I guess I'm, I'm wondering about is the extent to which the plan is going to make some long term commitments to route support. That is, if I go buy a house tomorrow, what I'd really like is some sense of certainty that 15 or 20 years from now, if there's a bus on that route now, how can I know whether it's likely gonna be here 20 years from now? Because otherwise I've just spent all this money on a house so I can get to the bus and, and then the bus is gone. Hmm. I don't know about exact strategies, I mean, I think we'll touch on funding. I think that's a big part of it, um, but also development. So if you buy a house somewhere and it does development policy at the local level, encourage the kind of development that maybe doesn't support transit and then it um, isn't sustainable. Um, I think that's so, part of 
part of the conversation. So let me tell you, let me tell you what my experience was. I grew up in Portland, Oregon. Uh, I grew up in Portland, Oregon, and beginning in the 70s, I could go get maps that would show me what it, what the plan was going to be over the next 25 to 50 years in terms of urban rural development. Obviously, we understood that some of that could change, but they, they tried to make some projections of where are we going to be and what are the areas that are going to be priorities for building out for more more transit. And I really appreciated that because, like I say, you want to buy houses, you want to uh, plan for things. And at least they made a good guess. At, look, what, what's, this, what's our transit system going to look like in 10, 20, 30 years? And they usually did it in steps. Yeah, I've not, you know, I've been at MTA for about five years and my experience with plans like that where they do, I think, you know, local comprehensive plans, development plans always say the right things and sort of project out of this is where development is going to be, it's going to be transit oriented, but then a lot of exceptions are made, maybe the private sector influences things differently and I don't think it always happens in such a way that it was originally planned. I do see another question, though, about um, announcing stops on the light rail. I mean, that's something we hope we should be doing now, <laughs> not in 50 years. Um, but to that end, as far as like accessibility and having audio announcements, we're sending out a survey to all the local providers and we'll take it ourselves to kind of assess which providers are already checking certain boxes in terms of how they use technology to make service more accessible and where there might be gaps. And so the statewide plan is intended to sort of put that in a matrix and say, okay, there are some areas where only some of the providers are doing this when all of us should be going by the standard. Um, and why aren't they doing it? Is it a funding barrier? Is it something else? Um, so trying to look at that, if that answers, I think it's Chiffon's question. So Jade, um can you can you give us kind of a um, idea of how many when you talk about different providers, how many providers exist in Maryland currently? <laughs> um, it de it depends on what you include, I guess, because in the Office of Local Transit Support, which is separate from mine and Jamie's office, they work with the local providers, and I want to say I've seen twenty. But then there are also other, um, I guess they call them human services providers that are more, I guess, private or nonprofit. They're not necessarily operated by the county that we also share funding with. Um, and that's, I don't know that count, but it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, and so I think one of the things that I've heard over the years, um, and now particularly um, with the area we serve, um, Howard and Anne Arundel County, is that it's very difficult, you know, to cross over to different providers, quote unquote. So if you want to make a trip from, you know, um, Glen Burnie and go to um, Western Maryland, you would have to, it would be like an all, maybe I, it probably longer than a day. It would, it would be a long tre trek to do that um, because of all the different place, providers you'd have to switch over and everyone kind of runs their own system. Um, and so I think that's been um, big. And I know when you present, you and Jamie presented this um, to the, um, regional transit plan um, implementation team, that, that was one of the things that I just didn't get. Like, why do we have all these providers? Why can't we just have one provider? Um, and so it could be like a seamless system. So I'm kind of hoping that this plan will make it, even if there are different providers, that it'll make it more seamless for um, people who, who use it. Um, yeah. This is Audrey from ARI. So um, I wanted to mention that um, there is a website that MTA has um, that Jade can't give right now because she's, you know, <laughs> Thank not you. on video, but um, I, I, I have it in the chat. I'm going to send it uh, right now. Um, and it includes an option for submitting comments and questions in a development timeline. There you go. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so, Jade, this is Laurie McGruder. I'm the Director of Resources for Independence in Western Maryland. Um, I guess my question is, I know that some of the um, some of the areas identified um, in the plan don't necessarily apply to like you know far western Maryland. Um, but how can we get involved? How can we at least know what's happening in you know the whole state? Um, 
or, you know, I know that there have been a, a few meetings um, and, you know, either my staff or my, or I have been able to attend, but are there other things that we could be doing? Right now, the main way that we're getting feedback is through meetings like this. And some of the folks on this call have been on other calls and, and we certainly appreciate the overlap because I think it, it takes talking to different audiences or even some overlapping audiences to get all the input that we need. So if you want a briefing with just your organization, I think you know we're happy to do that. Or even if your organization works within Western Maryland with other groups that we have not yet reached, we would definitely appreciate that connection too. And then we'll come back in, this is the timeline slide that I couldn't show. We'll come back in the spring roughly with a public draft and that will be available for comment. So other than this more like dialogue approach because we can't really go out and meet people face to face right now, um, we're just doing these virtual meetings and conversations and trying to get feedback that way. But then the plan will be published and people will be able to comment on it. I mean, you obviously can't be all things to all people. So what are you going to try to do? In other words, what, when you, if you feel successful, what will that look like? I think the main thing that we want to get out of this is identifying the gaps, sort of like what um, I think Katie mentioned earlier with um, the instances where people are trying to get from point A to B that crosses multiple jurisdictions. Is there an opportunity for there to be a more inner city service in that area in addition to the locally provided services? And for the existing local services, how do we better integrate them so it's not such a, a hassle to transfer from one to the other or to pay for each one separately? Or I, Bong has mentioned this in previous conversations for paratransit, not having to register for every single one and maybe having a statewide standard for that. I think those sort of things that better connect the overall system, regardless of who's operating what, or that can be sets a standard, even if there's some, you know, mergers and disbandment of how things are operated today over time, we all agree on some basic standards that should be in existence over the next 50 years. And Jade, I have a question for you. Um, so, um, and it popped in my head um, when someone mentioned about the light rail stops being announced. Um, it's not really regarded to light rail, but it's, it, it's regarded to the MARC train service. Um, are there any plans um, within the state plan um, of making the current MARC train stations that are not wheelchair accessible? accessible? Mm, that would be a really good question. <laughs> For Jamie, who works closely with our Mark Train side, I don't know if they have a plan. I think well, I know at least two of them, at least here on the Baltimore side. I, I think Martins and West Baltimore are not wheelchair accessible at all. Yeah, we um, part of the survey that I mentioned earlier for all all of the providers is a question about like, are your stops currently all ADA? compliant and if not it was a conversation around like do we all have a plan for that and how soon will they be fully compliant mm -hmm. well and i've always wanted to find out where all of the train the, the people who make the announcements on the mark trains do they all go to some place in new york for the sub where the subway train gets their training so that everybody makes sure that you can't understand a word they say i mean is it just are we just lucky that we that, that that's what we get because i got to tell you it's hilarious i can never understand what they say and part of it's because it's very poor amplification systems on the mark trains and then it's just because the person Either you can't hear them at all, and they're just way back in the middle of the place, or, or they, or they blow your head off. I mean, isn't there a way we could do something as simple as like teach these guys how to make announcements? <laughs> yeah, that I don't know. I don't know why they all sound the same. And there are certain trains, maybe the newer ones, where they sound more clear. They're trying to imitate New York subways. I'm sure of it. So I have more of a suggestion as opposed to a question. Um, 
I have several friends that grew up in the Long Island, New York City area. And for their paratransit, so uh, both counties in Long Island have separate paratransits as well as New York City. And so each of those systems has designated transfer spots where you get off one paratransit vehicle and then wait around for your next one and get onto that one. Uh, if you were going into New York City for work or something, for example. Um, and there are places in Maryland where multiple transit systems go, like BWI or Arundel Mills or whatever. But for people who aren't very um, technology savvy and don't really understand how to work Google Maps, uh, most people that I've talked to wouldn't know that they could certify for multiple paratransit buses, take one to Arundel Mills and then wait around for another one. Is there a way that we can make that a more formalized process? I think that's a suggestion that we're hearing a lot. So it's definitely something that we want to look into or even part of, usually when we do long range plans like this, there are short term, medium and long term strategies. And so the first ones are usually, if there's something we haven't already done a study of and decided what we want to do to address, I think this would be one of those things. Um, yeah, and so I think that was one of the uh, suggestions yeah. that I made um, to you, Jade, and Jamie about like a, like a transfer spot. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think that was one of the suggestions that I made. So yeah, I, I didn't want Chiffon's um, uh, suggestion to get lost. Um, she said, is there a way to have transit of all kinds to go beyond the standard routes because of people with disabilities do have to go outside the routes? Can that be in the plan? Sorry, I'm just reading it. Meaning, I'm not sure. I assume you're meaning something beyond the three quarters of a mile limit that, that the, I mean, the reason for that three quarters of a mile limit or the reason that we follow it is because of the money that's attached to it, mostly. Yeah, this, this is Shafan. Yeah, I'm referring to the beyond the three quarters of a mile standard. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a money thing. I think it's worth putting in the plan, that's for sure. But it, but it's definitely a money thing. that We get, we get 60 or 70 cents for every of every dollar comes from the feds at this point. Don't quote me on that number. I don't know what the real number is. Maybe Jade does. I just made that number up. The three quarter mile is set by um, federal standards, the ADA, but you, could, yeah. you, you do see that some local providers go beyond that and provide it statewide. I yeah. think for us, because we are a state agency and we go across so many jurisdictions, that would be incredibly expensive. And it would probably, I mean, if we didn't get any additional funding to do that, wouldn't it be a very good service, even if it was technically available. Well, I have a suggestion around the ever popular floating bus stops. <laughs> um, I suggest that given that there are several different varieties of floating bus stops at this point that we maybe look at national standards of some kind, work with other jurisdictions throughout the country to figure out what these floating bus stops ought to look like. It sort of feels pretty piecemeal right now that certain kinds get put up in Baltimore and a different kind get put up down in Montgomery County. And, and, and so, I guess as part of the plan, there would be some coordinated effort to take a look at jurisdictions throughout the United States and how they're managing this problem and, and, and making sure that whatever we pick has a great deal of input from people with disabilities so that we can resolve what appears to be a fairly controversial situation now. So can I add to that, Jade? Yeah, sure. So Mike, uh, just, um, just to let you know, actually, um, Myself and Christian um, and um, the chief deputies from MDOT um, and MTA um, are going to meet, be meeting this Thursday to talk about it. And um, uh, Jamie McKay, myself, and uh, Christian met a couple of days ago, um, and, and and we decided um, 
as a general practice, we're not going to call it floating bus stops anymore, just because there are a number of different styles of those type of bus stops, which actually have different names. So we're just going to call it bus stops. Um, but yeah, we're, we're looking into trying to standardize all of that. And, um, well, and I appreciate that. You had asked me for input on that and I, I have, did. I, I have did. not gotten back to you, but that's my input. My, my yes. input is don't, try to do this in a vacuum right look at nationally what's going on obviously we're not and europe by the way is another place to look for how they're dealing with bike paths and bike lanes and 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 pedestrians and and the interactions between them and cars and and so forth scooters it's all very complicated it's all very new but what i hate to see us do which appears to be what we've done so far which is to just kind of put something up and see how see if it works um, because it's creating all kinds of controversy in the community uh, we need to look worldwide at what's being done and i haven't gotten that sense yet right. besides i'm trying to avoid all the controversy anyway there's a few different people on this call I know from, from our area in Montgomery County who, who have a lot of um, opinions and information. I, Bong, you know you can't fix the problem by not calling it a floating bus stop anymore. And no, I know. <laughs> um, that doesn't cover up the issues. No, but I know no, no, no. has visited them. Abiola has visited them. Francie's on here. Pat Sheehan's on here. They've all been different kinds of disabilities, different concerns. So I just encourage them to speak up now because you've got Jade on here and this is the time to do it. Uh, this is Pat Sheehan. I'll be happy to speak. Go, Pat. Hey there. So the, my first question is to everybody, is what problem are we trying to solve? What we have put in place has been a situation where we have a floating bus stop put in place, rose by any other name, by the way. Um, and you violated four out of the six principles for Vision Zero. At the same time that you, you're putting these up, um, you, are, you don't have a pedestrian master plan. You don't have a pedestrian master plan. You are competing complete streets plan. Uh, you've got a bicycle master plan. That's part of the problem. Part of the problem is your decision to being made in a vacuum and the pedestrian master plan is going to supersede the bicycle plan when it's finished. And that's not a good way to do this. What the blindness community wants is for a moratorium on these bus stops being put in. The problem is not the bus stop. <laughs> problem is that there is no way for me to walk across that that um, bike lane, which to me looks, it acts very much like a sidewalk, without me, with me being safe in that area. Having a bus stop out there, I don't care what the bus stop is like, but you have to put the bus stop out there in the middle and you're asking me to trust in the back that a bicycle or scooter is going to see me. That is not acceptable to the blindness community. So my question is, you, I would put a moratorium. First, I would like to see them taken out. It's too expensive. We don't have the money statewide to be able to do the work that we need to do to get these put in. Secondly, if we're going to try to get bicycles and scooters off the sidewalks, and what you need to do is put a group together of bicyclists, uh, pedestrians, seniors, so that we can talk this through, not just put up floating bus stops and decide, um, oh, what do you think of this? Very poor planning. We've got at least four or five different styles. But once again, the problem is not the bus stop. The problem was the decision and how it was reached. And so we need to stop and start back over and uh, see what we can do about that. Um, I have to answer any questions regarding the position of the American Council of the Blind of uh, Maryland on this subject, if you'd like. Thank you for give, giving me a couple of minutes on the agenda. I appreciate it. Thanks. Sure. I imagine there are upcoming 
meetings, maybe with other staff at MTA who are working on that more directly. I'm not the best person, but I've made a note of it. Maybe Jamie can follow up on that. And Patrick, I did get your email, so thank you. And I will be sharing that this week. Great. You're, you're welcome on that. Yeah. Okay. A little late, but I think I'm back up and running. I don't know if y'all can see the presentation slides now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can we hear and see. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks. Let me just catch up. Um, so since we're nearing the end, I just go back to the comment about, um, I guess, certification and paratransit services. I did find out about, I want to say somewhere in Canada, that some new technology and apps have helped aid in being able to um, get people from, you know, one point on fixed route to then extend further using paratransit and transfers that way. Um, and that's sort of the, the long-term strategy too, just having it so you can get more places entirely on paratransit, but that the actual fixed route service is more accessible to begin with. So you're using paratransit more to complete the trip if it's long distance, um, rather than relying on it for the entire trip or every trip. I think that also requires, um, at least from what I've heard, better information and communication across all of the providers on which stops are actually accessible until we can say, you know, we don't have to distinguish because all of them are. And um, in, in terms of accessibility. So, sorry, that I have some lags going on. So in terms of accessibility, are you are you thinking um, for this plan that that's going to be one of the short term or short rate? What did you, you said short, medium, long or something? Something like that, yeah. short term, rather than yeah. like years, because I know that was something that um, was was really kind of upsetting to me in the um, Central Maryland Regional Transit Plan. It was a 25-year plan. Really, it was going to take 25 years to implement changes that should have already been implemented, seeing as how the law is now 30 years old. So um, I'm hoping that that accessibility and, and at least getting it up to 88, you know, even better than ADA standards um, will be a short range um, action item or whatever you call it. <laughs> yeah, and that's just going to be a part of the development of figuring out which things fall where. And define what short, medium, and long term is. Obviously, long is 50, <laughs> that's the limit, but where it is in. And with the Central Maryland plan, they did do the five-year work plan. I, I don't know if we're going to do something similar, but we're kind of paying attention to how implementation is playing out for that regional plan. Work for us. To what extent is our people, to what extent are jurisdictions going to have to follow this plan? Um, I mean, I don't think we can mandate it, and the statewide plan itself isn't mandated. It's something we're choosing to do. Um, so it'll be a stronger plan if it reflects the input that we've received from the locals, so they, you know, are bought into it, and it doesn't, it's not just, you know, what MTA is saying should be gotcha. done, done for the next two years, and agreed in terms of file instruction in shorter terms. Hmm. Hey, Jade, you're, you're really getting sounding patchy, and we're only hearing like half of every other word. But um, I, I did want to make a, a comment, um, as, um, as uh, Sarah mentioned. Um, you know, Shannon has been out to these um, these stops. I've been out. They're building them in my own neighborhood. I live in Tacoma Park, and I actually think one of the most important things as a starting point, certainly the con consultation 
with the community. And I'm not sure that that really happened. But secondly, for those who actually can't actually see how these things are set up, I feel like it's important to provide some kind of physical description. It really doesn't go far enough to just say it's just a bus stop or even a floating bus stop. What if you can imagine you've got these lovely lanes in the District of Columbia, for example, where they've um, widened the road and then added the lovely bike lanes like Amsterdam. And it, it is nice, but what the, the these quote unquote floating bus stops are doing is that they're, in, they're putting the bus stop where the bus would collect, uh, you know, uh, passengers on the outside of the bike lane. So you have the sidewalk and then you have the bike lane and then you have the area where someone would have to cross the bike lane to get to the bus stop in order. And so if you are someone who is um, mobility impaired, you're having to cross over a lane. And just imagine having to cross over even a car lane to catch a bus. It's not logical. It doesn't make sense, and I'm not sure who they actually spoke to to be able to come up with so hold these on, plans. Andrea. So, Jay, the issue is your cell phone is connected to your computer. You have to move your cell phone away from your computer. I just threw it on a chair. Nothing <laughs> <laughs> <And> that helps. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. But that was just that was my impression and particularly with what they're doing in Tacoma Park where I live and where you know Shannon you can certainly speak to how it's looking where you are but you know again you know I <clears throat> I I love the fact that they're in you know putting in bike lanes that's nice but do it in a way that makes sense for the entire community, and that's inclusive of persons with disabilities who are, may not be able to see persons coming, or maybe bicyclists are not going to see us coming, I have to step across that particular bike lane to get to the bus stop. And that's where I find what I find problematic. Yeah. Jade, can you mute yourself for a second, please? I'm sorry. There we go. So, uh, I agree with Abiola. Um, I went out to see um, the bus stop that's in the downtown Silver Spring area, and it was horrible. Um, it, sitting there, and as if I'm going to cross the street to cross the, the bike lane to get to the bus stop, two, two bikes came by and didn't even care that I was sitting there and didn't know if I was going to cross, didn't know what was going on, but they didn't stop. So they're not going to stop for us. And so some, I can see that they're coming, but someone that's visually impaired would just walk out there and get hit by a bike. Yeah, I think the work that Jamie has started with MTA in terms of inclusive planning is something that we should you know, spread more widely across the state before designing and implementing things like this. From what I'm hearing you and Abiola say, the, I think this is an instance in some transit planning, but in general where people design things based on assumed perfect behavior <laughs> of everyone who's um, interacting with that space. And that's not really what happens in reality. And I'm no, a I'm slow not. bike rider. But I've also been nearly run over by cyclists, by drivers who are not acting in the way that the you know, design was intended for. Well, and there's also just plain the issue of new uh, new accommodations to scooters and bikes and pedestrians and cars and how are they all going to interact. That's why I feel like we ought to be looking at what, what are we doing in Europe? What are, what are cities who have been at this a lot longer than we have? How have they tried to solve these problems to, to try and, because uh, I agree with you, it's, I think it, it, it represented kind of a lack of planning. And just to not, uh, just to take Bong back for, out from under the bus, Bong wasn't suggesting, I think, that we not call them floating bus stops in order to avoid the controversy. He was suggesting that it's just a stupid name. 
<laughs> well, no, I, 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 I was basically just saying that th there are different styles of these right. bus stops. Right. So, and they differ very, very slightly, um, but they all have the same, um, you know, concept or the, the same functionality, but the way that they're built from the sidewalk to the actual street, the terminology is different. So instead of saying, right. like a floating bus stop is 100% different than what they call a bulb bus stop. You so, mean there actually is such a thing as a floating bus stop definition? Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, so right. just for, um, you know, j just for simplicity, we're just going to say we're having conversations about newly developed bus stops. Gotcha. Okay. Well, that's fine. I, yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued by how we put all this together. I've never been, I would be glad by the way, to be on that team that goes to the Netherlands and then into Paris and then on whoa, to whoa, whoa, Berlin. Whoa, whoa. And, come on. Okay, I want to go with you, Mike. I want to investigate these things. It's all investigatory. It's and the state needs to pay my way. Yeah. Okay. So I think though, what you gather from this is people have lots of ideas and solutions and, um, had they been consulted first, and this has been Pat Sheehan's, you know, and, and others in, in our area in Montgomery County's, you know, major beef about this is, ha had you talked to a larger population first, you could have avoided it because now, of course, we're going to hear, oh, it's going to cost too much money to tear it down. Oh, it's going to cost too much money to change it. Oh, it's going to cost money. Well, you know what? If you'd talked to somebody before, you know, this wouldn't happen. So we appreciate you taking comments today. And hopefully one of the biggest things you'll walk away with is you've got a lot of folks on here who are very happy to share their opinions and experiences and, and that it'll prevent that from happening again or in more locations, which we already know there are multiple ones planned in um, Montgomery and Prince George's counties both. Well, and so Floating bus stop. One of the things that I would say that I've really appreciated um, with MTA is their work um, and Image Center and ARI also um, participated in work on the, their inclusive transportation planning process where people with disabilities are consulted in the planning stages, not after the plan has been written, you know, so, um, you know, hopefully that'll people might see MTA do it and decide it's a good idea. But, you know, that's part of the problem is that we've got all these different systems, 22 or however many systems Shade said, and um, they all work a little differently and they've all got, um, you know, different um, priorities. So um, thank you so much, Jade, for being on with us today. Um, the link is in the, um, in the chat to provide feedback. You could probably also Google Maryland statewide transit plan and find uh, what you need. You can um, do comments there, um, provide feedback. Uh, as mentioned before, next week, we have um, Samantha Wilson and um, is it, I'm gonna, I hope I'd pronounce your name right, Micah? Micah, Micah Wills. Micah Wills. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Um, and uh, who is going to be talking about the veteran directed um, home and community based services that are available in Maryland to um, veterans so they can um, avoid uh, being institutionalized um, and stay in their homes for as long as possible. Um, and so we're really excited to share that program with you and it's um, up and coming in, in the world and I, I know they're starting it in other areas of the state. Um, so make sure you stay tuned. Um, also, Jade put an email um, in where you can request a briefing or email additional comments in the chat. Mike, did you have something you wanted to add? I uh, just wanted to see if uh, a couple of things, I guess. One, uh, do we have any other community announcements that anyone would like to make to this week? Uh, this is your big chance. That if you have five or ten dollars, twenty dollars, whatever your whatever your budget is and can and can afford, we'd like to continue these broadcasts. They do cost us money, so if you can give uh, when you sign up there, the registration form, there's an opportunity for you to give what you what you're able to. Independence Access Maryland, sorry, Independence Amplified Maryland is a broadcast of Centers for Independent Living. We love doing this work and we plan on continuing it. If you have program ideas. 
please send them to info at imagemd.org, I-N-F-O at I-M-A-G-E-M-D.org. We love your program ideas. They help us know what people want to hear, programs that you wish they, we would have speakers about, and it can be either local or national issues. Please let us know so that we can uh, so that we can get in touch with people and say and, and get them on the show. Thank you all very much. Have a